Aloha kako and talofa. My name is Yaneta Le'i from Wailua, Hawaii, and I'm part of the Sundance Institute Indigenous Program. For over 40 years, Utah has been home to the Sundance Film Festival, and I'd like to acknowledge the Ute Tribal Nation, the ancestral keepers of the land that Sundance calls home. I would also like to honor the indigenous lands and people from which you join us, from our cold weather cousins in South Me lands to the Kanaka Maoli banded together atop Mauna Kea, Hawaii. Wherever you are in the world, enjoy our reimagined 2021 Sundance Film Festival. Hi, I'm John Nine. I'm a senior programmer here at Sundance, and I'd like to welcome you to this virtual component of the festival uh, and to this Cinema Cafe event in particular. It's part of our talks and events program. You're going to find a lot of amazing conversations in the festival this year, including several in the festival village area, and you can find out all about those conversations in the um, film program guide on our website. Cinema Cafe is also presented by Audible, so I want to thank them for their support. And I'm really honored to be welcoming two festival artists to this Cinema Cafe. Uh, both of them are here at Sundance, not as actors, but as directors of their debut feature films. And we were eager to bring them together to reflect on that experience, the creative and collaborative process behind it, and what compelled them to move behind the camera for the first time for these particular projects. Those two filmmakers are Rebecca Hall and Robin Wright, both of whom you know for countless roles on stage, film, television, including many films that have played here at Sundance. As directors, they've brought two beautiful, layered, spiritual films to the festival. Rebecca, Rebecca's film, Passing, is in the US Dramatic Competition. It's an adaptation of Nella Larson's Harlem Renaissance novel, and it stars Tessa Thompson and Ruth Nega. And Robin's film is Land, which is in the premiere section. Uh, she directs and also stars in, and it's gonna be released by Focus Features this year. And moderating today, I'd like to welcome Lindsay Barr. She is a film writer and critic for the Associated Press, and she's also previously covered movies for Entertainment Weekly. So I will throw it to you, Lindsay. Thank you so much for being here and congratulations on the beautiful, beautiful films. Um, I just want to get right into it too. And, you know, I'm always curious about when did you first start thinking about becoming a feature film director? And maybe Robin, you can start. I think it was always in the recesses of my mind. Oh, I would love to do that, but I'm not ready. Having been in the industry for almost 40 something years. Um, and then when I was on this Netflix show, House of Cards, and they gave me the opportunity to direct one of the episodes, I had such a great support team with so much experience, these crew members. And I basically got mini cinema school while I was there. What a gift that was, because <laughs> otherwise I would not have had the confidence to move on and do a feature film, that's for sure. Yeah. Rebecca, what about you? I mean, similarly, I, I think I've been, um, no, I've been, I've been thinking about it forever. It's, it's, it's what I've always <laughs> wanted to do. I just sort of, you know, I feel like I've just been stealthily, quietly, you know, masquerading on film sets as just an actor while s silently spying on everyone I've ever worked with. <laughs> <laughs> I love that question or that, that, that idea of when you're ready because without fail a lot of actresses who want to direct seem to always they they feel like they're not quite ready and they want to prepare more and then the men the actors who want to direct are like no i'm just going to go do it i don't I, do you find that that's true or did that feel true to you robin you mentioned that you know it's interesting because when you have a vision period or some you're resonating with a story in that time in your life because that's it's usually seasonal for me anyway where are you in your life and why does that thing resonate with you then you're basically a vessel your vessel for something that you understand intellectually whether these characters have nothing to do with you or everything to do with you um you're just kind of transporting morphing the emotions through as a director to share with the with the actors and bringing story around the direction 
And then you just, everybody's an architect of this piece that you had in your head. Absolutely, that's true. I, I second that very strongly. I mean, I, it's definitely true what you're saying for me, literally, because I wrote the first draft of this script nearly 15 years ago. So, you know, I... <laughs> And I, I did at the time, you know, because it, it felt very ambitious to me 15 years ago because I knew it was going to be black and white and I knew it had to be academy ratio and had all these sort of, I guess, quote unquote, art house tropes about it. Um, and it was period and a very complicated subject matter. And I just thought, well, that can't possibly be my first film. I'd be out of my mind. So it sat on a, in a drawer and I pretended like other things were going to be my first film. And, you know, eventually I wised up to the fact that this was the one that I knew how I wanted to make it exactly as Robin's saying, like at this moment. It's Rebecca, how did passing film. a novel from 1929 land sort of on your desk? Um, it did, how did the novel land on my desk? It didn't land on my desk. It was, it was completely a personal circumstances how I came across the book. I, no desk involved. You know, I was, 25 or whatever, I think, when I read it, and maybe a little older. And I uh, I was just beginning to think about this uh, aspect of my own family heritage and the fact that my grandfather was white passing and possibly even his parents were and what the legacy of that in a family means and how you grapple with that in relation to identity and all these things. and. And because the heritage was African-American and I was spending more time in America, I started to think more about how this, how racism is so baked into so much of this country's history. And that was such a sort of big reckoning for me personally at that moment in my life, as I was thinking about my proximity to that whilst also presenting white and everything that comes with that. And someone literally gave me the book as a sort of, you might find this interesting because you're thinking about this and you're talking about it. It was literally the fact it took me to my middle twenties before I even started sort of telling people because I didn't know how to talk about it. And this book was just very, uh, it was a big moment for me because I found it so extraordinary and so such a breathtaking modern contemporary work. Um, and from a purely artistic perspective, at the same time, I was like, I don't understand how this isn't a movie already. But that's how I came across it. That's an extraordinary background. Um, and, you know, Robin, obviously the creative paths towards both of these movies are a little different. And Land, tell us a little bit about how, how that came your way. And uh, because you, you also didn't write it, and it's my understanding that you maybe weren't even intending to star in it initially. Yes, both are correct. Um, again, it was during the time when, when I received the script. It was around the time where these random shootings were happening about biweekly in our country anyway. And it had gone from one every two to three months to biweekly. And it was becoming the norm. Oh, did you hear about the one in Florida? Did you hear about the one in Tennessee? Did you and I just, I read the script and it resonated so deeply about how do these people who lost their loved ones, how do they get through? Everybody deals with loss and grief in a different way. And I was thinking about all the different ways. And I wanted to make a movie at that time because there was so much pain in our country and the administration that we had to endure for four years and just the ugliness that was going on in the world with, you know, the explosion of Twitter and everybody was a judge and there was so much bullying going on. And I thought about the effect that had on children and how that's changing psychologically, our cellular makeup, mm. all this darkness and meanness and this movie there was one line in the movie. Why did you want to help me? And he just said, because you were in my path. I thought, what a beautiful, that's human kindness. And it's a movie about one woman's experience 
with dealing with grief. And she chooses to go live off the grid and do it in her way on her own terms and realizes that you need human connection and kindness to pull you through adversity. And I love too that both of these films are in some ways about women who are not just there as a product of finding a man or looking for love, they're, they're finding themselves in throughout both of these films too. And I, that sort of gets me into, you know, I think a lot of people watching this conversation are gonna wanna know how, how do you make this and how do you get the financing, that ugly word, which holds so many aspiring women directors back. Um, so I'm not sure if you can talk a little bit about just the logistics of that. You know, it's a, it's a real game of endurance. <laughs> You know, you it's like there's no other way around it. I I didn't make things particularly easy for myself. A lot of people said to me, if you make the film in colour, we'll give you the money. And it was still relatively, you know, it wasn't like a huge number. Um, and I said, no, I'm going to be stubborn. Sorry, but it's absolutely imperative to the movie. It makes sense. It works as a metaphor. It works for many, many reasons. It's not, it's just part of the movie. It is. And that made it very hard, honestly, for a long, 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 long time. Um, having, having Tessa Thompson and Ruth Negger as cast and having them championing the film made a huge difference. And then I was lucky enough to come across significant productions, which is Nina Young and Forrest Whitaker, and they they were really the just a sort of miracle of producers because they just said to me we get your vision and you've got to make it your way and we'll find the money for you to do it we will um but it was years it was years of like it's going it's not going it's going it's not going and that's that's something that you genuinely have to contend with and i, I suppose i just i got lucky because <laughs> the stubbornness paid off in the end hopefully but you know <laughs> what about you robin um it wasn't quite as long as rebecca's thankfully but it went through we had to go sell it we had to pitch it at the, the Cannes film festival you know where you sit in the room and every 10 minutes 15 to 20 distributors come in and you have to do the pitch and the and no one was biting they just kind of the air would kind of go out of the room like oh yeah but no <laughs> <laughs> we got to the end of the three day grind. And I was like, I don't think people are responding. I don't think we're going to get financed. And Focus Features was our last meeting. And they walked in and just said, we so get this movie and we want to make it for the same reason, because it's about human kindness and resilience and hope. And that's something we feel the world needs to be reminded of right now. And that was a done deal. I mean, it was, we jumped up and down in the room and celebrated. We were like that, it was kismet. It was meant to be. Absolutely. I'm sure that was deflating though. Oh gosh. Um, whether years or, or a day of, of no's too. <laughs> um, I want to talk yeah, a little those, bit those about- rooms, The pitch rooms are tough. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's no different than being an actor in the beginning where you just get turned down for no. years and years and years and everybody right. else- It sort of reminded me of that process. Yeah. <laughs> You're so used to it. Here I am. This is, I've got a song and I'm, I, this is how I dance. Give me money. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm curious too, you know, I've often heard that that cinematographers can be sort of a first time feature film director's best friend and, and best sort of asset. Um, so, you know, Rebecca, can you tell me a little bit about, about selecting yours and, and especially because there's such a specific look? Yeah, it was a sort of funny process, actually. I'd, I'd worked with Edu Grau, who was our cinematographer, twice as an actor. Um, but for lots of reasons, it was actually really important to me to try and find a, a woman cinematographer initially. And I did, I, there was another uh, DP who I was going to work with. And then sadly, there was a scheduling conflict kind of late in the day. And Edu was someone who I knew personally. And so I called up and was like, you know, I had mentioned it to him over the years, <laughs> so he knew what it was. Um, and he 
he read it and uh, jumped on a plane and, and came and, and did it. And it's sort of, you know, to use Robin's word from earlier, kismet or whatever, but he he so understood what what I was wanted for it in my highest sort of dreams. And it's, you know, that I wanted it to look a particular sort of black and white, that I wanted the movie to feel poetic and have this sort of looseness to it almost, sort of things look one way and then suddenly they can look because they're complete opposite at any given time and um, have this kind of fluidity to it and the actual look of the picture. And one of the brilliant things that he initially did was he showed me this lens called a Lomo. And he was like, this is, this is a wackadoodle idea to even suggest this lens because it's a huge anamorphic wide. But if we're cutting it down to 4.3, it's gonna compress what the Lomo does, which it sort of makes the top and the bottom of the frame very soft and sort of like weirdly abstract. But when you compress it down to the sort of absolute focus part of it, it gave it this very unique painterly poetic quality that I had just never seen before. And I was just so thrilled that he came up with that because it really does make the film. And he's, he's, he's got a real artist eye and, and, you know, we had a language already from working together as in a different capacity. And so, yeah, I mean, it's very important. I think when you do this the first time to have an experienced team around you that you trust, I mean, it sort of, there's all the difference really. <laughs> Robin, had you known Bobby in advance? Yeah, same. I had uh, done a movie with him as an actor called Rampart. And I had met with a number of other DPs via Skype because they were in other states and we were, the clock was ticking, we had to find somebody. And then Bobby wrote me this four page love letter about what this movie was about and how he envisioned shooting it. And I knew he was a man of nature. I knew this guy, if anybody could be 8,000 feet up on a mountain for two months, enduring the unpredictable weather patterns and never let go of that handheld camera, he was gonna get the shot. He's a picture taker. He really had, he's, he's got that, the frame, almost like you were saying, Rebecca, he's got this frame in his mind the way that he sits and meditates in nature. It's mm -hmm. exactly the way mm -hmm. he sees it. And nature is such a character in this movie, needed it to be. Yes, you did not make it easy on yourself, my goodness. I, I don't know how you managed to shoot through all of those different seasons, but can you talk a little bit about that and just sort of dealing with that unpredictability, as you said? We had the weather angels on our side, believe it or not, because we only had 29 days to shoot the whole movie. So we had to do four seasons in three years in 29 days. We had one day of summer. And then all of a sudden it just turned into winter fall in Canada. And so we had to shoot the 10 to 15 pieces in all the three years in one day. But it was doable. We just went out with a splinter crew. We were like, we thought we were gonna be shooting autumn. Let's just take you, me, Bobby, and the boom guy. And we zipped out into the fields and just shot a bunch of vignettes. And then when the snow dumped, we got to shoot all of our winter because originally we were planning to have to go back and ask Focus, can we have some more money? Cause we're gonna have to go shoot winter when it's winter because we're not gonna get snow. And we literally got snow for two weeks out of that 29 days, out of the blue in the month of October. It had never happened before. <laughs> so we were very lucky, very lucky. Bell guards on side, that's amazing. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> did anyone, you know, I, did anyone try to, you know, say that directing yourself, it's too much to handle for a first film or, you know, was, was that an anxiety of yours? I just like being behind the camera now that I've got the bug. Um, and the only, it was the same thing. We ran into scheduling conflicts and we had a window of time to make this movie with that amount of money, with that distribution company. And I didn't want to take the risk of losing the window. And so the producers, we were sitting around talking and I would always, when we were prepping, talking about scheduling or 
the tone of the film or the tone of the scene, I would act out the scene because they wouldn't really understand it otherwise. And then they finally just said, you've been acting all the scenes of the movie. Why don't you just do it? You're going to be there anyway. I was like, okay. And that's why it happened that way. I, I did reach out to a bunch of people, but you know, scheduling and other movies and kids, family. And I just thought, let's just go dive in the deep end. Let's just get it done. And it's not the most practical way to go about making a movie <laughs> when you're in front of the camera and you're in six feet of snow and you can't walk to the dip tent to watch playback because you're going to put footsteps in the snow and it's freshly fallen snow that we need to shoot. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> Rebecca, tell me a little too about just sort of creating the feel of, you know, 1929 New York and it's an incredibly glamorous film and a lot of wonderful interiors and costumes. And I'm sure you had it all in your head having thought about this for so long, but yeah, how did you convey that to your team? How did you find those places? Um, I had really good advice from one of my uh, executive producers, two, two significant people in my life who, who I worked with as an actor, they were directed me, Oren Moverman actually, and Angela Robinson was another one. Uh, they ended up being execs on the movie. And Angela, I remember Angela gave me this very sage bit of advice once where she said, the key to film directing is just repetition. Like you just keep talking about your vision until you go crazy. Like, if you think that people understand what you're saying, they don't. You have to say it again and again <laughs> and again. And I, was, and I thought that was really uh, sound advice, actually, because you can't, there is a sort of weird assumption that everyone understands what's going on in your head. And, uh, you know, when you talk to people, I, sometimes you can fall into this trap of just assuming that you get it right. You can see what I'm seeing and then you show up and it doesn't look anything like that. And you sort of, then you realize, you know, you're at fault because you just didn't communicate it properly. So it really is, uh, it really is a trick of trying to work out communication. I think that goes for talking to actors too. You've got to sort of assess what any actor needs and work out how to communicate to them the best in any moment. And that was something I definitely learned from watching my father direct actors. So I don't know in terms of the, you know, I had a really... Nora Mendes was the production designer, incredible. Marcy Rogers, costume designer, incredible. They just, they had reams of research. They brought, every, they, they talked to each other about the black and white because there's a, you know, if you're working in black and white, there's a, there has to be such a strong dialogue between the costumes and the color of the wall because you want to make sure that the contrast is right in any given moment. And they were just astonishing what they delivered um, given the circumstances. So. I tried to keep it very small as well. You know, the sort of you communicate Harlem with one shot and then you move on. And, and there's a certain amount of, of um, there's a certain amount of fantasy in the, in the look of the film. You know, it's not, it's not necessarily a realistic depiction of this time. It's a realistic depiction of how this world is presented in this book, which is very specific. And there is a certain, you know, there are elements where the film is actually performing as much as the people in it. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, certainly. Um, you both had to have worked in your careers with some of the best male and female directors to, you know, uh, when you're preparing to direct your own film, is there someone you're thinking of in your memory to being like, that's who I want to be like, or, or is it just all you and, and coming at it your own way? Maybe Robin, you can go first there. I mean, you definitely, over the years, like Rebecca was saying, where you're, you know, this, biting your tongue while on set going, God, I really could direct that scene better. Um, you, you're gonna bring your own style to derivatives of other things that you've watched your whole life. What, what, like Julian Schnabel is one of my favorite directors and I've always loved his movies and Diving Bell and the Butterfly was a great inspiration for the elliptical flashbacks I put in my movie. I was like, I want it to look like that. And taking the silence of most of Black Stallion, the film, and re-watching that and feeling the heartbeat of that film 
and how beautifully displayed it is. There's no dialogue. And you, you're, you're just, you're adapting those beautiful ideas with your own style. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely agree with that. I, um, I have a sort of long list of films that inspired me specifically for this. And I don't know, but I do think at the end of the day, it's just sort of like you, you learn that it's really about having the, it's mostly about having the confidence to trust your gut because ultimately it comes down to you looking at a frame and going, do I like that or do I not? Do I like what's happening in this? Is it hitting me in the right place? And if it's not, then you just work out what's wrong with it. And you, in my case, it always involved removing quite a lot of furniture, which I think upset the production team. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Like make it simpler <laughs> but you know I think that I think that's what it boils down to and I think you there are there are things that you I looked to a lot of old films and I thought about the quality of stillness like you're talking about Robin about the way a, a lot of old films that I love I was trying to pinpoint the quality that I loved about them and often it was something as simple as just staying in the shot longer than we're used to seeing now and you know, I, I also, I come from the theater and I love watching people act and talk and I like seeing both things happening together. So there would be this sort of, I liked a, that. And I was also very interested in finding ways to play emotional beats, not necessarily on faces, but on other things that tell the story, whether it's the shoulder or the way a shot dissolves out of focus or, you know, that sort of thing was very important to me. I love your film, Rebecca. It's so beautiful. I, I wish I could talk to you about it more. Wow. What I feel the same about it. I would like to. Thank you. Maybe one day. All right, thank you. <laughs> nice talking with you guys. Bye. Great talking with you. Thank you, bye-bye.